In today's world, the importance of free speech cannot be overstated. It is a fundamental right that forms the bedrock of a healthy, democratic society, allowing for the exchange of ideas, debate, and dissent. Many of us are unaware of how this essential freedom is gradually being eroded by laws and cultural shifts that seek to silence uncomfortable or controversial voices. In a compelling speech, Rowan Atkinson, a renowned actor and comedian, passionately argues that the right to free expression is the second most precious thing in life. In this video, we'll delve into Atkinson's thought-provoking speech on the creeping culture of censorship and why it's crucial to defend our right to speak freely. The most precious thing in life, I think, is food in your mouth. And the third most precious is a roof over your head. But a fixture for me in the number two slot is free expression just below the need to sustain life itself. That is because I have enjoyed free expression in this country all my professional life and fully expect to continue to do so. Personally, I suspect highly unlikely to be arrested for whatever laws exist to contain free expression because of the undoubtedly privileged position that is afforded to those of a high public profile. So my concerns are less for myself and more for those more vulnerable because of their lower profile like the man arrested in Oxford for calling a police horse gay. <laughs> or the teenager arrested for calling the Church of Scientology a cult. Or the cafe owner arrested for displaying passages from the Bible on a TV screen. Are you, are you saying this at this time? Everyone is prepared at this time. Yeah. My moment of time is 1847, okay, approaching on the to get the charges again, okay? I can't have the suit. You don't have to say anything, but it may not be offensive. You're not going to make some questions, something which you make behind. No, we'll have to make the case. Okay, yeah. So, the grounds are that by taking part in the organisation of this event yeah. this evening, I suspect that you are taking part to, yeah. to cause serious disruption to UK airports. Uh, the politicians have failed us. They've failed us with a 1.5% exposure degree, exposure from the state. Um, hi, so my name is Daniel. I'm being arrested. I'm not really sure why. I'm at my parents' house right now. Um, I was just here in London visiting my parents. I think I've been told I'm under arrest for conspiracy to commit a public nuisance. Uh, well, this is what happens when you resist the British state. No. <coughs> how should police would realise how ridiculous this is? It is ridiculous. What did what did what did it need to come to? Tell us why you to this level, because I don't understand. I posted something that he posted. You come to arrest me, you don't arrest him. Why has it come to this? Why am I in cuffs because of something he shared then I shared? Because someone has been caused obviously anxiety based upon your social media page. That's not why you've been arrested. Aaron, I've got the law. This is your warning. If you continue, you will be arrested. On one side, that's it. I've got to do it. Eh? You might as well come then. One more time. Go on, arrest me. Eh? Arrest me. Go on. 2023, spread the train with the red. When I heard of some of these more ludicrous offences and charges, I remembered that I had been here before in a fictional context. I once did a show called Not the Nine O'Clock News some years ago, and we did a sketch where Griff Reese Jones played Constable Savage a manifestly racist police officer <laughs> to whom I, as his station commander, is giving a dressing down for arresting a black man on a whole string of ridiculous, trumped up and ludicrous charges. The charges for which Constable Savage arrested Mr. Winston Kodogo of 55 Mercer Road were these. I want to talk to you about some charges that you've been bringing lately. I think that perhaps you're being a little overzealous. <laughs> Which charge did you mean, Zenta? Well, for instance, this one. Loitering with intent to use a pedestrian crossing. 
Savage, maybe you're not aware of this, but it is not illegal to use a pedestrian crossing. Neither is smelling of foreign food. <laughs> An offence. You sure, sir? <laughs> also, there is no law against urinating in a public convenience. <laughs> Or coughing without due care and attention. <laughs> if you say so, sir. Yes, I do say so, Savage. Some of these cases are just plain stupid. Looking at me in a funny way. <laughs> Is this some kind of joke, Savage? No, sir. And we have some more here. Walking on the cracks in the paper. <laughs> Walking in a loud shirt in a built-up area <laughs> during the hours of darkness and walking around with an offensive wife. <laughs> in short, Savage, in the space of one month, you have brought 117 ridiculous, trumped-up and ludicrous charges. Yes, sir. Against the same man. <laughs> yes, sir. Who would have thought? that we would end up with a law that would allow life to imitate art so exactly. I read somewhere a defender of the status quo claiming that the fact that the gay horse case was dropped after the arrested man refused to pay the, uh, to pay the fine and that the Scientology case was also dropped at some point during the court process was proof that the law was working well, <laughs> ignoring the fact that the only reason these cases were dropped was because of the publicity that they had attracted. The police sensed that ridicule was just around the corner and withdrew their actions. But what about the thousands of other cases that did not enjoy the oxygen of publicity, that weren't quite ludicrous enough to attract media attention? Even for those actions that were withdrawn, people were arrested, questioned, taken to court, and then released. You know, that isn't a law working properly. That is censoriousness of the most intimidating kind, guaranteed to have, as Lord Deer says, a chilling effect on free expression and free protest. Parliament's Joint Committee on Human Rights summarised, as you may know, this whole issue very well by saying, while arresting a protester for using <coughs> threatening or abusive speech may, depending on the circumstances, be a proportionate response we do not think that language or behaviour that is merely insulting should ever be criminalised in this way. The clear problem with the outlawing of insult is that too many things can be interpreted as such. Criticism is easily construed as insult by certain parties. Ridicule easily construed as insult. Sarcasm, unfavourable co comparison, merely stating an alternative point of view to the orthodoxy can be interpreted as insult. And because so many things can be interpreted as insult, it is hardly surprising that so many things have been, as the examples I talked about earlier show. Went on to say that you did not want your money going to immigrants who, quote, rape our kids and get priority, end quote. Oh. This offence is so serious that an immediate custodial sentence is unavoidable. Would you stand, please? The sentence that I pass has been reduced by one third to reflect your guilty plea. The sentence is one of 20 months imprisonment. Although the law under discussion has been on the statute book for over 25 years, it is indicative of a culture that has taken hold of the programmes of successive governments that, with the reasonable and well-intentioned ambition to contain obnoxious elements in society has created a society of an extraordinarily authoritarian and controlling nature. That is what you might call the new intolerance, a new but intense desire to gag uncomfortable voices of dissent. I am not intolerant, say many people, say many softly spoken, highly educated, liberal-minded people. I am only intolerant of intolerance. <laughs> And people tend to nod sagely and say, oh, yes, wise words, wise words. And yet if you think about this supposedly inarguable statement for longer than five seconds, you realise that all it is advocating is the replacement of one kind of intolerance with another, which to me doesn't represent any kind of progress at all. 
Underlying prejudices, injustices or resentments are not addressed by arresting people. They are addressed by the issues being aired, argued and dealt with, preferably outside the legal process. We will guarantee a prison cell. We will make sure that those people who need to be in prison will be in prison, not necessarily in the area where they live. They may be two, three hundred miles away from home, but we will guarantee people a prison cell. With the numbers are so tight there, how can you make that guarantee? They are tight and that's why we've initiated Operation Early Dawn. So basically the easiest way to describe it is one in, one out. So as people get released, we can then pick up people from police cells and take them to court and we will triage that three times a day. For me, the best way to increase society's resistance to insulting or offensive speech is to allow a lot more of it. As with childhood diseases, you can better resist those germs to which you have been exposed. We need to build our immunity <coughs> to taking offense so that we can deal with the issues that perfectly justified criticism can raise. Our priority should be to deal with the message, not the messenger. As President Obama said in an address to the United Nations only a month or so ago, laudable efforts to restrict speech can become a tool to silence critics or oppress minorities. The strongest weapon against hateful speech is not repression, it is more speech. And that's the essence of my thesis, more speech. <clears throat> if we want a robust society, we need more robust dialogue, and that must include the right to insult or to offend. And as, even if, as Lord Deere says, you know, the freedom to be inoffensive is no freedom at all. Um, where a communication uh, is, as it were, merely offensive, offensive mm. grossly offensive, uh, etc., then um, principles of free speech and free expression um, require there to be a high threshold um, and dictate that a prosecution is unlikely to be in the public interest in many of those cases. Mm. And the... Um Factors which will suggest people might not be prosecuted include things like deleting it quickly if you've sobered up in the morning. Can you explain about that? One thing that's very important in this area is that where free speech um, protects uh, the subject matter, um, a prosecution must be proportionate. And when considering whether a prosecution is proportionate, the question of whether a communication is removed quickly, uh, whether the individual expresses remorse, mm. whether access to the communication is blocked, these are obviously relevant to any assessment of proportionality. And will it be more or less likely for individuals to be prosecuted criminally now when they're using Twitter or Facebook, do you think? It's not possible to say whether it's more or less likely. There simply haven't been enough cases. But this is clearly signalling that in those cases that are protected by freedom of expression, um, then there's a double safeguard, a high threshold, um, and consideration of the public interest uh, before a prosecution will be brought. A newspaper rings up Scotland Yard. Someone has said something slightly insulting on Twitter about someone who we think a national treasure. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> and the police panic and they scrabble around and then grasp the most inappropriate lifeline of all, Section 5 of the Public Order Act, that thing where you can arrest anybody for saying anything that might be construed by anyone else as insulting. You know, they don't seem to need a real victim. They need only to make the judgment that somebody could have been offended if they had heard or read what has been said. The most ludicrous degree of latitude. The storms that surround Twitter and Facebook comment have raised some fascinating issues about free speech, which we haven't really yet come to terms with. Firstly, that we all have to take responsibility for what we say, which is quite a good lesson to learn. But secondly, we've learned how appallingly prickly and intolerant society has become of even the mildest adverse comment. The law should not be aiding and abetting this new intolerance. Free speech can only suffer if the law prevents us from dealing with its consequences. I offer my wholehearted support to the Reform Section 5 campaign. In lugar, but igual de importante, estamos emprendiendo un cambio de paradigma no solo económico, sino también social, político y cultural. Y con este cambio vamos a contramano de la dirección que en el último tiempo están emprendiendo muchos países del mundo. 
Mientras otros países proponen censura, nosotros proponemos libertad de expresión. Miren tan solo lo que pasa en Inglaterra. Desde que los socialistas llegaron al poder, están metiendo presa a la gente por postear en redes sociales. Bueno, a los periodistas de acá también les gustaría, porque digamos, no les gusta que hayan perdido el, mic, el monopolio del micrófono y poder utilizar esa herramienta para extorsionar y ensuciar, calumniar sin costo alguno. Las redes sociales les pasan facturas y no les gustan. Dejen de buscar fantasmas. Están recibiendo lo mismo que hicieron, pero nada más que la gente lo hace orgánicamente porque se dio cuenta que son unos delincuentes, muchos de ellos. A su vez, mientras otros están cada vez más cerca de caer en las guerras culturales y religiosas, que va a terminar por expulsar a gente de bien de sus países de origen, nosotros invitamos al resto del mundo libre a participar de un país en reconstrucción.